Hi, and welcome back to AI for Healthcare Lecture Series. And here we're going to dive into virology and then talk about data science and models and eventually also the pathology itself. So viruses, first of all, are infectious uh, units. The diameter is between 16 to 300 uh, nanometers. Their size makes them unfilterable. Uh, that is, they are not retained by bacteria-proof filters. And they have evolved over a long period of time and have adapted to specific organisms, organisms in their cells. The infectious virus particles, which are called virions, are composed of proteins and are surrounded in some species of viruses by a lipid membrane, which is referred to as an envelope. The particles uh, uh, contain only one kind of nucleic acid, either DNA or RNA. So that's the difference you need to know. They do not reproduce by uh, division, such as bacteria, yeasts, or other cells, but they replicate in the living cells that they infect. So in them, they develop their genomic activity and produce the components from which they are made. They encode neither their own protein synthesis machinery uh, ribosomes, as it's called, nor the energy generating metabolic pathways. Therefore, viruses are intracellular par parasites. They are able to reroute and modify the course of cellular processes from optimal execution of their own reprodu reproduction. Besides the genetic information uh, uh, encoding the structural components, they are additionally they possess genes that code for several regulatory active proteins such as trans activators and enzymes such as proteases and polymerases. Don't worry about all these te the terminology. I've been doing a lot of reading and I'll be using a few more terms which I will try to have it in the transcript so you can read it uh, um, and, 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 and try to sort of do more uh, uh, research on the literature. So AI, data science, and all these things, and try to combine this with AI healthcare um, uh, is not easy. A lot of people are doing a lot of interesting things. But before we get into all that, uh, you need to understand what kind of models are actually in place today. Because there are different models for different things. Uh, you know, for uh, disease predict prediction, for example, there have been many models in endemic and uh, epidemic disease models. Uh, disease is transmitted through vectors. Uh, models of mixing, for example, heterogeneity of mixing is an interesting model. For instance, it's been often observed in epidemics that most infectives do not transmit infections at all or transmit infections to very specific few others. This suggests that homogeneous mixing at the beginning of an epidemic may not be a good approximation, meaning old people to old people. Well, I think we've learned a little bit from that ourselves already. In epidemiology, public health professionals uh, can play a major role actually in the discipline of AI uh, and medicine altogether. And in the current situation where we are in today, it should be no different. So that's why it's very important to listen to public health uh, officials like WHO and the guys who are actually in the midst of uh, in between this crisis. In 1906, uh, uh, W.H. Hammer, um, uh, he argued that the spread of infection should depend on the number of susceptible individuals and the number of infective individuals, which is just suggesting that the mass action law for the rate of new infections and this idea has been a basic formulation of compartmental models. So uh, since that time, it's, it's worth noting that the foundations of the entire approach uh, to epidemiology based on compartmental models uh, was laid. It was not laid by mathematicians or AI or data scientists guys as we would like to be, would like to be but by primarily by public health physicians. Uh, and there are a couple of names, um, and I think I'll just add these names under the transcript. Uh, so, but it, it has happened from 1900 to 1935. A particularly Im interesting example is the work of Ross, uh, Sir Donald Ross. He was awarded a second Nobel Prize in Medicine in 1902 for his demonstration of the dynamics of transmission of malaria between mosquitoes and humans. Uh, so that's a very, very interesting thing too. But we'll get into a mathematical modeling of epidemiology in the next bunch of lectures. SARS is the plague of the 21st century. Believe it or not, this is what, where we are today. In 2003, it emerged in the birthplace place in Guangdong province in China. It affected 8,000 people in 25 countries. It seems like such a small number today. Uh, it exposed actually the vulnerability of our modern globalized world. This is like 17 years ago. And it, we were still sort of living in a pre-industrialized uh, era, if you talk about you know, all the travel and everything else is going on. 
SARS and similar emerging diseases uh, could neither have spread so rapidly uh, nor would have had such great impact, you know, if you spoke 50 or 60 years ago, it would have been a really small contained phenomena. But with this global interconnectedness, um, affluence, and also sort of uh, demand for wild game as exotic food uh, led to the development of large trade of live animals being transported all over the world in animal markets where many species of wild and domestic animals were co-housed and provided, it provided a great sort of, you know, perfect place for interspecies transmission of viruses and other microbes. Once that virus jumps uh, species and um, attacked humans, the increased mobility of humans back in 2003 and, and fast forward to today, um, it spread rapidly. An infected patient from Guangdong who had actually stayed in uh, just for just for one day uh, in a hotel in, in Hong Kong led to the transmission of the disease to 16 other guests uh, from uh, who traveled on to see the outbreaks to other parts of the world in Toronto, Singapore, Vietnam and, and, and obviously Hong Kong itself. The virus exploited the particles uh, practices um, uh, used in, in modern intensive care uh, in severe with severe respiratory diseases and weaknesses of our own infectious infection control practices within the healthcare system, causing outbreaks inside hospitals as well. So that was the first learning. It further amplified the spread of the disease. Today, uh, thankfully, we are doing a lot, lot better than back then, but the damage is still much higher. So it's kind of, you know, crazy. Uh, we haven't learned much uh, about the pathology itself. We've learned how to react. So SARS, which is uh, a, you know, is acute respiratory infectious disease, is caused by a novel coronavirus, COV, and SARS-associated COV, SARS-CoV, and COV-2 with a single stranded plus sense RNA. I'll use these sort of in, into transcript so you can. Uh, sort of see a proper definition. So there is no effective uh, treatment today um, as such. The possibility of the RNA interference or the therapeutic uh, approach to fight the disease uh, uh, was generated to target the SARS-CoV genome. It's called the SIRNA. Coronavirus genomic organization structure or the virionic structure as I mentioned at the beginning uh, is it contains of a non-segmented positive sense RNA genome of approximately 30 kilobyte. Uh, the genome contains a five um, cap structure along the three poly A tail uh, allowing it to act as an mRNA for translation of the replicase polyproteins. Uh, like I said, for details with these uh, transcripts, which you will see, uh, you please go ahead and read the literature yourself to understand more about that. So what we are seeing lately in all the pictures all around the world is the club-shaped spike projections emanating from the surface of the virion, the particle. Uh, these spikes are defining features of the virion and give us sort of uh, appearance of a solar corona, uh, like the sun prompting the name coronaviruses. So coronaviruses particles actually contain of four uh, structural proteins. These are S, spike proteins S, membrane M, envelope E, and nucleocapsid N proteins, all of which are encoded within the three end of the viral genome. Uh, just take a look about in animals how it works. So the coronaviruses uh, cause a large variety of diseases in animals and that we know already by now. Their ability causes severe uh, uh, disease in livestock and companion animals like pigs, cows, chickens, dogs, cats. And there have been many researches done in the past. So cat owners, I'm not saying that you should, there's a reason to worry, but it's important to understand these. So I'll just use a few terms now. So transmissible gastroenteritis via TGE, TGEV and PEDV, it causes severe gastroenteritis in young piglets, leading to significant mortality. And obviously, you know, in animal husbandry, if that is your business, it leads to huge economic losses. PEDV recently emerged a few years ago in uh, North America for the first time causing huge losses of young piglets. 
And PHEV is a virus that mostly leads to um, the infection uh, that has the ability to infect the nervous system, causing encephalitis uh, and vomiting and a bunch of other diseases. There's also feline enteric, uh, enteric coronavirus, FCOV. It causes mild asymptomatic uh, infections of domestic cats, but during per persistent infection, mutation forms of the virus into highly virulent strain of FCOV, which is your feline infection. So it's also called FIPV. Uh, so but much of mumbo jumbo, but you, you can I think follow these. Uh, how is it spreading in humans? So prior to the SARS-CoV outbreak, coronaviruses were thought to just have mild self-limiting sort of respiratory infections in humans. Um, two of these sort of human coronaviruses are an alpha coronavirus. It's called a HCOV 229E and HCOV NL63. And there are two beta viruses called HCOV OC43 and HKU1. So 229E and OC43 are isolated nearly 50 years ago, while the N63, NL63 and HKU1 have recently been identified during the SARS-CoV outbreak. Um, and this, uh, so this is dramatically transforming as well as we've seen many mutations, more uh, approximately 15 already as they've been transmitting across humans. So this literature and information needs to be updated definitely. So these viruses are endemic in human populations and pandemic today, as you can see today. So from endemic, it's already kind of moving into a pandi pa pandemic situation. They cause more serious diseases in neonatus and el in elderly and individuals with underlying diseases. That was, you know, we've been seeing and a greater sort of incidence of low respiratory tract and infections in these populations. NL63 is also associated with acute laryngotracheitis which uh, is, is, as you know, sort of in the lung disease. So the one interesting thing is about the differences in their tolerance of genetic variability. So 229E isolates from around the world have only a minimal sequence divergence, while OC43 isolates from the same location, but isolated in different years shows significant genetic variability. So this, this kind of explains um, also the inability of 229E to cross the species barrier to infect the mice, while OC43 and the closely related bovine virus, BCOV, are capable of infecting mice and several other species. So besides the ability of uh, uh, the MHB to cause the uh, disease, it has been suggested that the human calves may be involved in developing a multiple sclerosis as well. There is no evidence to that. But we're just kind of concerned that, you know, uh, uh, will this play a significant role in the coming years as we see new variants and new mutations. Uh, uh, the SARS-CoV group 2B beta coronavirus was identified as a causative agent for SARS outbreak in 2002-2003 in Guangdong province in China, as I mentioned. And it is the and, and what we are seeing today is is actually um, sort of an amplification, not only in numbers but also in what is happening. Back then, if you just remember, eighty uh, close to nine thousand people, seven hundred, close to eight hundred deaths with a mortality rate of nine percent. And today, although it's less, but you know it's affecting the global population. So elderly people had the mortality rate approaching 50% of individuals 60 years of age or, or more. But today we are seeing that those sort of, you know, uh, the demographics are changing. There are 30s and the 40s and the 50s uh, people in those age groups are suffering. So economic activity, if you just remember back um, in, in, in 2003, 2004 timeframe was close to 40 billion. And we're looking at trillions of dollars of losses already in this sort of outbreak today in coronavirus too. Um, so, you know, back then it's just spread to two dozen countries, SARS, I'm talking about SARS and I keep saying 2003, today we're talking about 170 countries. During the epidemic, so the closely, uh, so, you know, uh, it was isolated only in the civets and the raccoon dogs. And in my last lecture, we just look up, uh, there's also pangolin. Um, an armadillo, kind of an animal, looking, it looks like an armadillo, that animal. Um, so SARS originated originally in Chinese horseshoe bats containing a sequence of SARS-related uh, coves. Uh, and the serologic evidence from the prior infection of the related coves, serologic meaning taking blood samples. 
In fact, the two novel bad SARS-related uh, coves have been identified uh, that are similar to SARS-CoV than any other virus identified to date. And they were also found to use the same receptor as the human virus, um, the ACE2, uh, which is angiotensin converting enzyme 2. ACE2, it basically uh, uh, providing further evidence that SARS-CoV-2 originated in bats. The ACE2, for those who do not know, is an enzyme that is attached to the outer surface of, of the cells in the lungs and the arteries and heart and kidney and intestines. And its main function is to lower the blood pressure, but it also serves as an entry point into the cells for some of these coronaviruses. So we have to be extremely careful uh, about this. Although some human individuals within the vet animal markets and serologic evidence from SARS-CoV infection prior to the outbreak, these individuals had no apparent symptoms. Um, and, and like I said, this information is constantly evolving. So please do look at the relevant and latest literature. So uh, the vet animal markets for the several years uh, before the series of you know, factors facilitating to the spread in a larger population has seen this growth already. Uh, transmission of SARS-CoV was relatively inefficient uh, back, you know, if you look at 10 years ago. And the spread was only when it, you came in direct contact, contact with uh, infected individuals in the onset of the disease. So the outbreak was largely contained within the households and the healthcare settings, except a few cases where super spreading, like super spreaders people talk about, where individuals were able to infect multiple contacts during um, enhanced development of the viral burden and um, ability to aerosolize uh, the virus or be able to spread it through your physical contact and sneezing and all those things. As a result of the relatively inefficient transmission of SARS-CoV, initially the outbreak was able, we were able to contain the outbreak through quarantining. That's what we tried, but now it was not working because we're looking at COVID-2, which is totally different sort of in nature. So a small number of SARS, they happen in a controlled way. Uh, it was a kind of a controlled outbreak back then. And they infect the epithelial cells within the lung. So the virus is capable of entering the macrophages and dendritic cells but only leads to an abortive infection. So the macrophages and all these stones I was listening when I was talking to one of our researchers, she just completed a PhD. These are white blood cells in the immune system that engulfs and digests uh, cellular debris, uh, you know, foreign substances, even microbes, cancer cells, anything else uh, that has uh, 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 that has not to do with type of proteins uh, specific to the health of body cells. Uh, and, and then it kills these in the process called phagocytosis. Um, but like I said, just you know, look into relevant literature. Despite this, so the infection of these cells types is important in inducing pro-inflammatory uh, cytokines that actually contribute to the disease. In fact, many cytokines and chemokines uh, are produced by these cell types and are elevated in the serum of SARS-CoV infected patients. The exact mechanism of the lung injury and the cause of the disease in humans is still undetermined. I think that we were going to find out in the next couple of years. So the viral titters uh, seem to diminish from severe uh, uh, disease develops in both humans and several animal models of this disease. There's another thing to note is that the animals infected from the rodent adapted SARS-CoV strains show similar clinical features to human diseases including age dependency uh, uh, as the with the disease severity. These animals also show increased levels of pro-inflammatory cytokines and reduced T-cell responses, suggesting a possible immune, immunopathological mechanisms of this disease. I think I posted a sort of an article a long time ago, video of a T-cell. So what is a T-cell? It's basically a lymphocyte which develops into a thymus gland this the T cells and plays uh, a major key role in your immune uh, uh, response. So sort of recapping this, SARS-CoV-2 epidemic was controlled reasonably in 2003 and the virus has since returned you know back in the Middle East and it was called MERS, uh, the Middle East uh, SARS variant in 2012. So it keeps coming back. Uh, uh, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome cough or MERS-CoV was found to be the causative agent in a series of highly pathogenic respiratory tracts infections in Saudi Arabia and other countries in the Middle East. 
So based on the high, so in this case, the, the mortality was pretty high, 50% in the early stages of the outbreak. It was feared that the virus would lead to a very serious outbreak back then. Um, but since, uh, still it was kind of, it didn't accelerate uh, in 2013. So, you know, people, so there were some sporadic cases that continued to the rest of the year, but it didn't kind of, it didn't continue throughout the next year. In 2014, a spike of over 200 cases and almost 40, 40 deaths uh, occurred. And, and you know, it prompted the fears within epidemiologists, immunologists, virologists that the virus had mutated and had more capable of human to human transmission. We're talking about 2012, 2014 timeframe. So more likely the increased number of cases resulted in the improved detection and reporting methods combined with seasonal increases in uh, birthing of camels as sort of, you know, MERS was kind of originated from the camels. In, uh, in 2014, sometime in August, uh, you know, a total of 855 cases of MERS-CoV had resulted in 333 deaths. And the mortality was, uh, case mortality, case fatality uh, was close to 40% back then. So this is not long ago. Uh, we've just been ignorant about what was happening around in the other regions, but this is what's true. So the SARS, it's a group is a 2C B uh, beta coronavirus related to the two previously identified bat coronavirus HKU and HKU4, HKU4, HKU5. So, so you know we tend to forget all these things. It's been here, it's been with us, um, and and uh, and I'm, I think there's a lot of research going on. Obviously today we are all hands on deck and everybody's sort of spending billions. But in the last 17 years, I just still wonder how much. Uh, how much work has been done in uh, in the past consistently to understand the mutative capabilities of this virus? There's a lot at stake actually today. If you're looking at, at the current situation, um, I will go into the next bunch of lectures talking about um, a couple of aspects of of you know the mutation uh, of of the virus. Uh, understanding of the mathematical models to, uh, to, to see how we can kind of create more uh, reliable, realistic mathematical models uh, uh, and then eventually apply these models to help uh, our... So very quickly summarizing, uh, there's a lot that needs to be done in the medical industry uh, and I'm sure technology will play a great role as we try to accelerate our research whether in understanding uh, how we can prevent it, how we can fight it if it is in between us, and how to find ways to cure it faster. Um, the next bunch of lectures will talk a little bit in detail about the mathematical models, uh, what can we learn from them, uh, can we apply these into, um, into any of our machine learning or data science uh, uh, pipelines. Uh, and obviously look into uh, a more uh, deeper aspects into virology or molecular virology. I'll try to keep the lectures a little bit high level because I'm myself trying to understand this uh, so I don't want to go deeper into these. Uh, obviously if you are yourself a virologist, immunologist or epidemiologist and if you think it makes sense to listen to what I have said, uh, please uh, go ahead and you know see uh, how, how we want to try to help uh, this industry. If you are a data science professional, uh, uh, someone from the technical field like me, uh, makes a lot of sense to dive deeper into understanding this pathology uh, and uh, the impact that it has from a virological, immunological, and obviously an epidemiological perspective for the rest of the world. So uh, in the next bunch of lectures, we'll go deeper into mathematical models and a bunch of other uh, ideas and hope this gives you um, a better understanding uh, like I am gaining my understanding the last couple of weeks uh, to and, and hopefully come up with some novel ideas and solutions that will help us. So see you guys in the next class. Thank you.